In Advent, we see the recognition of the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love of Christ expressed as candles, and then Christ himself as the candle in the middle. All of those attributes are given to God, and all those attributes are to be given and found within us as well. I pray we all seek that. I want to go into the Word of God this morning. Today we celebrate the the coming of the Prince of Peace. That is what we see in the the Advent candle of peace, is the, the Prince of Peace. Whenever I'm asked for what I want for Christmas or my birthday or any event, and you ever ask me what I want for Groundhog's Day, I'm going to tell you the same thing. I want peace. I know that sounds like a beauty pageant answer. What do you want? World peace, world peace. But I really do want peace. World peace is a huge and wonderful thing. We're to pray every day for the peace of Jerusalem, right? I pray for the peace in my house. I pray for the peace within my heart starting right here. Peace, peace, peace. I would love peace. To be able to experience peace. I don't know how many of you, you know, I work outside in a, a regular job as well. I have 92 employees, and the thing I want from them is peace. I want them all to get along. I want everybody to be in harmony and in, to be in unity. I want peace. But those of us who are Christians, those of us who follow Christ, you've got to remember what peace looks like to us. A lot of times, peace looks like the waves crashing over the hull of the ship, the wind blowing, all of these things going on. You say, how can that look like peace? It's because I can look at Jesus laying down in the bow of the boat asleep. We need to be like Christ in the midst of the storm. That is what peace looks like. Peace is not the absence of chaos, the absence of struggle, the absence of all these things going on in our lives. That's not what peace is. Peace is the authority given to us by Christ Jesus to persevere and go through. That is what peace looks like. Peace in the midst of the storm, not separate from the storm. In this world you will have trouble. But what's he said there? Don't worry. I've overcome the world. Exactly. In Christ Jesus, that is where we find peace. Peace comes from Christ. Peace comes from God. Peace is a, it's more than that. Peace is a gift from God. There is none of you in here within your own understanding and your own ability who can create peace within you. So many of you have experienced so many things in your life. So many of you have experienced so many, no much loss. Today, this morning at 8.52, this morning it had been one year since my mother left this earth and received her eternal war, a war, reward. And so how can you make it? How could you go through? I gave a, I preached a candlelight service that night, the night that she had passed away. So how can you do that? I can't do that. Christ within me can do that. Though. He is my peace. Peace is a gift. Like I said, you cannot make peace. They try and say that all the time, you know, oh, the, it, 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 the problem's not ending the war. The problem is winning the peace, right? And it's like that within all of us and with all the things that we fight every day. And it's because we don't give the fight over to Jesus. He is called the prince of what? Peace. That is his realm. That is where he lives. That is where his authority is seen more than anything else. How many of you know that whenever the queen or now the king of England, wherever house she happens to be sleeping in that night, that's where they raise her flag, right? In residence there is the queen. Church, it's time for us to start pulling up our flag and say, you know what? Peace is living here. I have peace. I have that perfect peace. I have that only because Jesus Christ is in me. I've told y'all over and over and over again, this year to come, there is so much than this year to come, I believe that we're going to see. But we need to see it as an opportunity for hope and an opportunity to give the peace of Christ to those who are going to be in such turmoil. I really do believe that this year is going to show us what a storm looks like. Whenever the disciples were there, they were as close to Jesus as you could ever be, right? And remember the storm began to wave and the waves were coming across and the wind was blowing. All these things were happening. They thought for sure that they were going to die. They were right there with Christ. How could they worry about themselves? They were there in the boat with Him. 
They were right there. Why would they be so worried? Why would they be so concerned? They finally shook him and they woke him up. And he stood up and he said two things. The first word, the first word that he spoke was what? Peace. And then he said what? Be still. I believe that peace was his speaking unto the wind and the waves and the be still. That was to the disciples in the boat. Be still. How many of you have ever told your kids, can't you be still? And I see it in church a lot. Can't you be still? How often does God look over the portals of heaven at us and say, can't you be still? Why are you so worried? Why are you so concerned about these things? I am in control. I am the Prince of Peace. His perfected peace. Jesus himself knew that we weren't going to understand. So he, he, told you, he told us this. He said, look, peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. It is a gift. We can't work for it. We can't make it. He says, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Things are going to come forward. And if we read in Scripture, we need a prophecy. It says that things will be so strong and think people will be so scared that their hearts will stop. Can you imagine that? That's, that's a clinical fright. That does happen. But he's telling us, look, all these things are coming, but you know what? Don't be afraid. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, they said what? Be not afraid. When the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, he said what? Be not afraid. All these people who tell me all these stories about all the angels that they've ever seen, Unless your story starts off with you absolutely scared out of your mind, I'm probably not going to believe what you have to say. I'm going to see that you came into the presence of something that overwhelmed you to the point that they had to say, be not afraid. It's all right. It's all right. He tells us, be not afraid, because he is with us. We've got a few kids scattered in here. Where are all the kids we had last week? I just hate to ask. We've got a few kids in here, but we had a bunch of kids last week. We had a few kids scattered, and I'm glad to have them. So I asked the question, kids, have you, have you ever been afraid? Is there anything you've ever been scared of? Is there anything, maybe afraid of the dark? Or, a lot of kids are afraid of the weather. I know a lot of adults that are afraid of the weather when the lightning crashes and the thunder and all these things go off. You know, they, they, they're afraid of the weather. And I can understand that. But adults, I've, if even if you're not afraid of the weather, I bet there's something maybe that upsets you. How about that word? Is there something that throws you off kilter? Something when it happens in your life, it just throws you off, and it's just not, it's not right. Maybe it's not a storm, but well, maybe it's a storm, but not made up of wind and waves or rain or snow. It's a storm of everything going on around you. Like if you're caught up in a how many of you ever feel like you've been ever caught up in a tornado or caught up in a hurricane? You're just going every which way. You, you just can't begin to imagine. You can't find that, that solid ground that you need as you're caught up in this storm. I don't know if any of you know, but they've started a thing, and it's not just Louisiana, but Louisiana, a lot of it. That we're, we're naming every storm that comes through. Now, we've always named hurricanes, right? We've always named hurricanes. But now, like, like the ice storm, too, it, it was a named storm. If we have a really bad hailstorm, it's a named storm. Why are they naming all of these storms? When in doubt, always follow the money. I'm going to ask somebody, I'm going to look at somebody that works in the insurance, and most of your homeowner's policy, if it's a named storm, your deductible doubles. Some people, it goes up a multiple of 10, I'm told, if it's a named storm. <laughs> ah. The named ice storm, my deductible doubled. But so I was told. Maybe I was told wrong. But so I was told. But I don't mind when they name a storm. I like giving a name to a storm. I like giving a name to the things that come up in my life. God likes to be able to talk to them and tell them, you know what? Jesus has control over you. Jesus is giving me peace over you. Two years ago, I had a storm come into my life, and it was named Wedding. Both of my daughters decided to get married in the same year within six months of each other. Five months of each other. I don't know how many of you have paid for a wedding lately. 
I gave my daughters a choice. I said, you can either have the big wedding or you can take the cash. One took the big wedding and one took the cash. Cost me the same either way. So I heard a story this week about a man that had three daughters. Made me think about Paul Reed. If y'all know Paul and Elizabeth, they got six daughters. I just don't know. I just, I just, I just don't know. But the man in the story had three daughters. But the problem is it was about 2,000 years ago. And he did not have the money for his daughters to get married. And at that point in time, that would have meant that one, it would have meant that his daughters would have had to stay with him forever. His daughters would have had to stay with him forever. How many of you got kids and say, oh, we want our kids to stay with us forever. We don't want our kids to ever move out. Well, I don't know about that. Because the other thing is that had his daughters never moved out, never gotten married, never had kids, never had grandkids, who would have taken care of him when he got old? I'm just saying, my my kids aren't here, but they're going to watch. That's your job. You got to take care of mom and daddy when you get old. So he needed his daughters to be married, especially at that time, 2,000 years ago. Well, a local preacher heard his story, and he had pity on him. And so the preacher went and took enough money, coins, and dropped them in the window one night for the oldest daughter to get married. Then a few weeks later, he came and dropped coins in through the window for the second daughter to get married. You know, the dad's elated in all of this. This is, I mean, this is a true blessing from God. But he also had realized that somebody's sneaking in my daughter's windows. <laughs> Maybe I might need to think about this. So he began to hide out, having a pretty good idea that someone was coming for the third daughter. And he caught that somebody. But you know, there was a little secret too, because that person had, some people just stand out in a crowd. I don't know if you know, you know anybody like that that just stands out in a crowd? Well, this particular preacher, he stood out in a crowd. It was hard for him to remain anonymous. Everybody was going to find him. Everybody would know who he was. He wasn't a very good hider. He wasn't exactly what you'd call a ninja. He stood out. He stood out from the crowd. And everybody's like, well, who could this be? He, He said, I want to be anonymous. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. But well... Maybe you should have changed your idea of fashion sense and a way that you could have stood out, maybe blended in with the crowd a little better. Because the way to stay anonymous, the first thing is, is you don't wear a red cape or a red hat. It's kind of hard to sneak around like that. But this young preacher, that's what he wore and that's what he was famous for. And he'd wear that and he'd go around town and the, the dad called him. He said, please, please, please. He said, don't, don't tell anybody. I, I want to remain anonymous. You know what the preacher's name was? It was? Nicholas. He lived in Turkey. The apostle Paul went to Turkey and spread the gospel there. And Nicholas's great, great, great parent, grandparents became Christian. Nicholas's parents died when Nicholas was very, very young. He was very young and his parents died, but they left him a whole lot of money. When Nicholas grew up, he said, I'm going to do two things. He said, one, I'm going to commit my life to spreading the gospel, the good news of Christ. And two, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give away everything that my parents left for me. But he wanted to do it anonymous. Well, this is not what you wear. You sure can't walk around in a big old red hat. If y'all are for any of y'all from... Um, Man, sir, somebody saw me in this morning and they said, that's the same outfit the Boudin King used to wear for the Couchon de Lay. I said, well, I like that. I wouldn't mind being known as the Boudin King. I could do that. So he couldn't exactly sneak around like that. But he said, please, don't, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. But any time after that, anything would happen mysteriously. If somebody was given a gift, they would automatically assume it was Nicholas, the little preacher up the street. That must have been Nicholas that did that. And on and on and on, he would, he would get, not to say get blamed, but everything that good happened, they said, well, Nicholas must have done that. 
But another thing began to come up. Whenever Nicholas dropped the money in through the window, I don't, let me bring a, a good way to describe this. So people at night, they would take off their shoes and they'd put them over by the window to dry out. I don't know, a good way. Their, their feet stank. Their shoes stank. It was a way to air them out. They didn't have all these different shoes. They put them over by the window let them air out at night. Well, if you can kind of maybe see where I'm going as the story begins to progress, you know, people would tell the story of what Nicholas did, and they put some coins in the shoes and stockings like we do now, but even now Holland, they put some money, they'll wake up in the morning, have some money in their, in their, in their shoes, and it'll be there, and, and they'll accredit it to Nicholas or St. Nicholas. It's all right to say St. Nicholas, because you do realize that each and every one of you who've accepted Jesus Christ is a saint, right? St. Daryl, St. Brandon. These are, these are our saints. St. Claudine, of course. We, we know that. That even has a good ring to it. I like that. St. Claudine. We are all saints. There's nothing wrong with that. You do understand that we don't pray to the saints. We have but one intercessor, and that is Christ Jesus. We don't pray to him. But there's nothing wrong with us remembering the things that they have done. As a matter of fact, this year, I'm going to challenge each and every one of you to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Y'all need to read that. I think it's going to be a good um, primer or education in the world that we see coming up in the years to come. I want you to read about the lives of the saints. There's nothing wrong with using that word. A particular denomination took it from us, and we're not allowed to use it anymore. We can use it. When the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. That has nothing to do with football. I hate football. I have no use for football. It has nothing to do with football. When the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. I want to be counted as a saint. I want, to be, I want to be given a crown just long enough that I can take it off my head and throw it at his feet. I want to be given a robe so I can take it off and lay it down at his feet. I want it just that long. Just long enough to be able to give it away. So we've got Nicholas. Like I said, he was an orphan. But he found a way. He said, I'm going to take that money and I'm going to take care of people. I'm going to give to people. Whatever they need, that's what I'm going to give them. Whatever they may happen to need. And the reminder of what we have from Nicholas is not just his generosity, but it's a reminder of his obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice, right? He was obedient until the end to Christ Jesus. Jesus himself told us in Luke chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, he said, When you serve a meal, don't invite your friends your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, they'll invite you back, and that'll be your only reward. Instead, he said, invite who? Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Be generous. Be generous. There is nothing wrong at this time of year in giving gifts to others and showing your generosity. But how about this? How about in giving gifts to those you do not know? To be able to bring them the things that they need. This coming Sunday, the ones who are hungry, we're going to give them food. We got some clothes in the back. They need clothes. We're going to give them some clothes. We're giving away Bibles because everyone needs what? The Word of God. We got a prayer tent setting up because everyone needs what? Prayer. I've told y'all before, if you don't know what to pray for or who to pray for, you pray for me. Me, I'm, ask, I'm, I'm asking. I don't think that's asking. I think that's telling. If you don't know what to pray for, who to pray for, pray for me. And you pray for every other pastor of every other church you passed by to get here this morning. Pray for the area pastors. Those of you who have been going through the 30 days what we have of pray and go, that's one of the days now. You pray for pastors. You pray for church members. You pray for strangers as you drive by the houses. So we're going to have prayer tents set up. We're going to give them that, the thing that they need. And also, we're going to be cooking two hogs, and we're going to be cooking jambalaya, because everyone needs pork. Amen. You're supposed to say amen. Amen. Everyone needs pork. Now, I'm from Avoyles Parish. Marcy's from Evangelist Parish. We share a few things across the line. But there is a law in Avoyles Parish. If two or three people are gathered, a pig has to die. It's a rule, it's the law, I can't do anything about it. So, hopefully we're going to have enough people 
Several churches are coming in together, and we're going to have at least two hogs and some jambalaya. We're going to be giving people what they need. And the main thing that people need, and we're always reminded this time of year, I hope, is that they need Jesus. How many of you ever looked at anybody and said, you need Jesus? How many of you ever looked at your kids and thought that? You need Jesus. We don't know what the age of knowledge is when a, Christ know, when a child knows that they need Jesus. But as parents, we know when they need Jesus. They need grace. I pray for God, give me grace. Why well, I name my second daughter Grace is because that's to remind me, oh Lord God, thank you for giving me grace. So I can handle grace. All these years of praying over, she's grown, grown to be a wonderful woman of God, as has her sister Matea. We're giving wonderful husbands as men of God, but I had to pray for a lot of grace. It took a lot of grace to be able to get to that point. We need to remember always to be able to tell others about Jesus. Nicholas devoted his entire life to telling others about Jesus. That's all he did was Jesus. If you ever watched the Christmas Carol or Scrooge, and he said, oh, i got to be about my business. And they said, mankind is my business. My business is sharing Christ Jesus with everyone. That is what I'm called to do. The great commandment says what? For us to go into all the world, proclaiming the gospel, making disciples. That's your job too. Nicholas devoted his life to that. You should. Are you ever going to have days when things don't go quite right? How many of you ever tried to witness to someone and it just didn't quite go right? Well, I bet it went better for you than it did for Nicholas. Nicholas, I was at a preacher's meeting one day. I don't know if y'all have ever been in a preacher's meeting. You probably have, but if you've ever been in a room with 14, 15, 20 preachers, whew, some things get going sometimes. Well, one of them decided that he was going to stand up and say that Jesus was not God. A preacher. You say, oh, how could that happen? Oh, I must have been because that was 2,000 years ago. No, I promise you, you can turn on a TV set right now and probably find a, a preacher saying something just as much heresy as that. But one of the preachers said, God, Jesus is not God. And he kept saying it. He kept going on and on and on and on. And well, Nicholas, Nicholas got as red as his robe and his fancy hat there, his Buddha and King hat. He got that red, and finally he went up. He went up to the other pastor. The other pastor, name was Arius. And he, um, or charismatic kind of in here, he laid his hands upon him. You understand how that is? He slapped him. He did. He had enough. He went up to him and he slapped him. Look, they even took, look, uh, you don't believe me? They took a picture. It's right there. Look. He slapped him. Somebody put it up on the Facebook. Anything you do, it ain't going to be staying secret. He slapped him. So St. Nicholas slaps Arius on the face. Boom, right there. Slapped him. This is about the year 200, 300. He slapped him. Well, they took Nicholas and they arrested him. They threw him in jail. How many of you ever spent a night in jail? Don't raise your hand. I didn't mean it that way. I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that. I've ridden in the back seat of a p patrol car. I will tell you that, but... Nicholas had to go to jail. But in jail, in prison, Nicholas repented. You know what that means? Nicholas told God, I'm sorry. That's part one. And part two, I will never do that again. Nicholas repented. The other pastors got him out of prison. They invited him back in. They said, Nicholas, we forgive you. And Nicholas, you were right. Jesus Christ is God fully, completely. Because the word of God they went to was John 1.1. 1, 1, and John 1.1 1, 1 told us what? In the beginning was God. And the God, and the word, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. They said, Nicholas, you're right. Arius, you're wrong. So he said, okay. Now, does being right give you the reason, the opportunity to be able to slap someone? No. Kids, don't slap somebody when you get mad. Jesus told us if you get into that situation, he said you're to do what to your enemies? Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Though Nicholas was wrong in that. He should not have done that. But he stood up for what he knew to be the truth. Now, we are smart enough to know that we can stand up for what we know to be the truth without having to lay our hands on somebody, right? 
You, you do understand that. I sure hope you understand that. You can be right without having to be violent. So whenever what was needed was truth, Nicholas gave what? Truth. Whenever a situation you're in needs peace, what do you need to bring? Peace. If you know somebody that needs money, what do you need to bring? Money. Straight up church, we awful quick to offer up love and prayers, but sometimes you know what people need? They need money. They're in need. I had somebody this past week that couldn't buy groceries. Somebody in this church had already taken care of that and said, he'll come, I'll give you some money and I know that somebody's going to need it. Bam. Next day. Look, we can't afford to buy groceries or toilet paper. No problem. Done. Wait, what do you mean? I said, that's it. No problem. It's done. Somebody else a few days later said, look, I'm desperately in need for, for $100. I need it. Done. I said, what do you mean? I said, done. Somebody's already given it. It's done. If that's what you need, that's what I'm going to give you. How about time? What if someone needs time? When are you going to give them? Time. What if they need love? What are you going to give them? Love. If they need mercy, what are you going to give them? Mercy. It's better to give than to receive because if you can give it, you got it. That's what Brother Donald taught us. I can only give someone peace if I have peace. I can only give someone love if I have love. I can only give someone time if I have set aside time for them. And the greatest gift we can give so often now, mothers, fathers, grandparents, our children, our grandchildren, is to give them time, give them your attention. That's what we need to be, is to pour into the lives of others. There are so many people right now that are in need of Jesus, and we need to give them Jesus. Totally and completely useless little bit of trivia. I like to throw that out every now and then. Nicholas gave money to the father, and the father had how many daughters? Look, three. Y'all are so, that's so good. How many of you ever been to a pawn shop? I love pawn shops. I've been to the pawn shop in Las Vegas. I've been to the pawn shop. Hanging out in front of a pawn shop, there's always what hanging out there on the sign. How many of y'all are smart? Come on. Three balls. Three gold balls that signify the three bags of gold that St. Nicholas gave to that dad that was in such need. How many people run up so many situations, they got nothing, they don't know nothing at all. They, at the end, of the wit's end, and they go to the pawn shop and pawn their wedding rings or whatever because I've got to have food for my kids or whatever. And that was a set aside by St. Nicholas. But a pawn shop is always required that what? If you get the money back within 30 days, you can get it back. We'll help you out and you can come back. But for 30 days, you know, we're going to help you out. So that's why they do that in honor of St. Nicholas. Because of his generosity. Maybe you need to know someone that's in need. If you don't, you need to pray because they're out there. Pray, Lord God, show me. Bring into my path every day those that are in need of something. One thing we're going to give next Sunday too is we're going to have a communion service and then our candlelight service. Because what we all need is to remember the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. We celebrate so often the the gift of Christ given to us at the Christmas season in the first Advent. At Easter, a lot of times, some of us are seen to be hung up on Christ's sacrifice, which is wonderful, noble. The greatest thing ever given to us is death. But it is not fully appreciated until you realize that he was resurrected and that he's coming again. We all celebrate tomorrow that Jesus came, but how many of us are living our lives in accordance with the fact that he's coming again? Is there someone in here that, to use the term, needs Jesus? Is there someone here that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior? Or maybe you did and you decided, you know what, I'm going to do just like my Christmas tree. I'm going to put it up, look at it, it's wonderful, it's great, and then I'm going to take it down and I'm not going to think about it till the next year. Maybe you've done that with your salvation. It's kind of come and gone, something you can hang up, put away. You need something today. I love what happened in Acts chapter 3 and verse 6. You remember Peter when they were walking in the city and the guy was laying there and he was a beggar. And the beggar began to holler out to them that they would give him what? Silver and gold. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but that which I have I give unto you. 
that which is given through Jesus Christ, arise and walk. Today, Jesus Christ has given you the ability to rise and walk and come down this aisle and receive the one thing that you need, not silver and gold, but what you need is eternal life. We all know what the Scriptures tell us. We've all read Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says that everyone has sinned. There's no one in here that is good. No, not one. Everyone has sinned and comes short of the glory of God. But Romans 6, 23 gives us a promise in that what? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a gift, and you must receive it. You must take it as a gift. And everyone knows John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. That's the gift I'm offering y'all this morning. I am simply as Nicholas was. I'm just the conduit. I'm able to take what I've been given and share it with you. I have been given eternal life through Jesus Christ, and I want to share that with you. I want to give to you the gospel, the good news, because Jesus told me I had to go, and I had to proclaim that gospel to all the world. You know where I'm starting? I'm starting right here with you. I'm asking you, will you accept the gift of Jesus Christ today? Is there anyone that needs to accept Christ for the first time? Or anyone that has gone so far away that they need to be reminded? They need to be refilled with that salvation And it's not an emotion or a feeling. It's a confidence that Jesus Christ has saved me. Do you need that reassurance? Is there anyone here that would have me to pray with you this morning? The camera's not rolling. Nobody's going to see any of that. Anyone in this church that I can pray with this morning that simply needs that gift? Well, then if not, then everyone in here has accepted Christ Jesus. So then you have become not the receiver, but the giver. Everyone in here has been tasked to give that gift away. To share it with others. I'm going to show you how simple it is. Let me have, get some kids. Let me get the kids come up here. Let me get, come on, you're a kid. Anyone under the age of, under the age of, how old are you, Alex? Under, almost 20? Anyone under the age of 20? Anyone under the age of 20, come on. I'm going to give you as a, come on up here. I'm going to show you how easy it is to share the gospel. Jesus Christ died for you, Alex. Jesus Christ died for you, Joel. Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ came and was born, and he died for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus is our Savior. And Jesus came for no other reason than to love you and save you. Jesus Christ came for you. Jesus Christ came for you. Jesus Christ came for you as well. Jesus Christ came for you. That's that's the gospel. You say it's so hard. What is the good news? Come on, come on. Jesus Christ came for you. No, she's going to take a handful. And why is she going to take a handful? Because she's going to do what with it? She's going to go out there and she's going to share it with someone else. That's how it works. Pat, you know how it works? Pat knows how it works. There you go. Okay, we can do that. Pat said he's hungry and y'all need to bring side dishes next Sunday. You have not because why? You ask not. That's it. We make it so hard to share the gospel. It's not that hard. They can be real excited when they find out what's in here because they like what's in here better than they do a quarter, a nickel, or a dollar. That's how simple it is that you would simply receive what God has for you. God blessed Nicholas so he could give others. God's blessed you so you can give to others. That's how simple it is. That's it. 
God has given you a gift. Can you leave it under the tree? One of the hardest things I've ever done, I had to go home last year at Christmas, and I had gifts made out to my mom. She passed away on Christmas Eve, and there were gifts there that were never open. But I began to think and remember, how many of you, are you out there, the gift's there, it's got your name on it, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, and you just, you're not going to open it. You're not going to accept it. How greedy is that of you? Because it's for you to receive it, accept it, and then share it with others. I want you all to leave from here. I told you what the agenda was next Sunday. We're going to come. We're going to give away food. We're going to give away clothes. We're going to eat. We're going to have candlelight service. We're going to have fireworks. And the most important part of the agenda says what? Go home. That's it. Y'all going to go home. Today, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go home. You're going to go home and you're going to share what you've learned here with someone else. Share with them some Jesus. I'd love to have you come back over to Marksville, the church tonight at 5 o'clock. We're going to have a candlelight service there. I would love for you to bring someone with you. That way I know that you actually received the gift and it's in true intent because you received it and you gave it away. That's what I want to see happen. John, would you provide a blessing for us today as we leave?